Beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you all for coming out. I mean, it really means a lot to me. And thanks for uh, EFA, uh, Dylan, Viga, and the staff really for making this happen. This is, um, this is the first time I've physically held the book. Uh, they just came in and um, I've uh, heard from Doug Armato, the head of the press, that he just got his copy a few hours ago. In fact, he was just commenting on how beautifully the images work with the book. And so I want to really thank uh, Marina for her work on this. I, it was uh, really, it was this kind of gorgeous, strange book. And then she was like, oh yeah, I'll sign on to that and just made it stranger and more gorgeous and curious. So there's something to be said for that. Um, and uh, just because I'm here to hawk merchandise, uh, we're also uh, selling uh, digital lithos of these. And so you can contact myself and Marina in any of the formats uh, you like to contact us about that. And uh, we also have a book on sale, 40% off for you tonight. So uh, uh, feel free to uh, avail yourself of that. Animals of the world unite. You have nothing to lose but your chains. I've tried handing animals weapons, kitchen knives, a slightly rusted back or chain, a shotgun, tools for the revolution. Lord knows they need a revolution and have suffered enough abuse in the hands of humans. They generally stare at me blankly. They look at the anthropocentric machines I extend to them and stare at them again blankly. With bare look and still corporeal thickness, these animals make no motion towards arming themselves. Now I feel like the idiot. What do I know about their revolutions? Perhaps they come already armed. Perhaps the revolution is underway in modalities I have yet to know. I'm beyond what I can reason within the limits of my human sensibilities and sociabilities. Since with a paranoid critical eye, we can see that animals are getting at something that undoes human technologies and cultures in myriad ways at different scales and temporalities across the globe. In perhaps Dadaist fashion, but with a meaning that stumbles because language fails us here. Let us call this an animal revolution. So I'm, I'm gonna to try to read from just a few different sections that hopefully when woven together makes some sense. The exploit, soap bubbles and Immanuel Kant, military supercarriers and spineless animals, other nuclear power problems, hacking bodies. Time is out of joint, Shakespeare said. Humans and animals occupy the same earth, but live in different perceptual worlds. This is the fundamental insight of the Estonian zoologist, Jakob von Oskol, a founder of behavioral physiology. Jakob planned on earning his living the old fashioned way by inheritance. His was an early 20th century life of respectable university education, leather chair, private, uh, leather chair private libraries, preprandials on the veranda, and summering at the seaside at Tata Villas. His was a well, he was well read philosophy, skilled in music, and combined his passion for biology with the hobbyist enthusiasm of natural history and collecting. It was all going quite well until Bolshevism and the Russian Revolution appropriated aristocratic wealth and forced the now middle aged Jaka to work for a living. So he did what any good deposed aristocrat might do. He founded a center at the University of Hamburg and made himself director, thus bestowing upon himself legitimacy, a job, and a title. Even for its day, the Institute for Environmental Research was a rather unusual venture since it combined Oxford's interest in physiology, 
with his university days, uh, from his university days, with his broad interest in philosophy and aesthetics. Now, among the books in Jacob's library were a well-worn collection of works by the 18th century German philosopher Immanuel Kant. Paging through these dense tomes, he reflected on the critique of pure reason, the foundation of Kant's thinking, and what garnered him the title of the Copernicus of philosophy. See, Copernicus had shifted uh, from a Ptolemaic universe with the Earth at its center to a heliocentric solar system. For Kant, the shift was from a thing-centered universe to a perceiver-centered one. We do not see things as they are, a thing-centered universe. Rather, we perceive them as they are for us, as they appear to our senses, perceiver-centered universe. It's like having a vacuum with a special triangle adapter that only sucks up triangle-shaped things. Empty the bin and you discover the world is made up of triangles. What doesn't get hoovered up and what we miss are all the other shit. Kant was the guy who figured out our cleaner, our cleaner attachment apparatus. Now, Osco began to think about flies and ticks and cats and bees and earthworms and their physiological differences. These were so many vacuums and so many attachments and accessories. Rather than imagine each animal's perceptual world as a vacuum cleaner, he wrote about them as soap bubbles surrounding the animal. Quote, when we ourselves step into one of these bubbles, the familiar meadow is transformed. Many of its colorful features disappear. Others no longer belong together, but appear in new relationships. A new world comes into being. And here in the foray of the world of animals and humans, he coined the term umwelt, or surrounding world, to describe this perceptual bubble. Each of us is in a bubble, trying to imagine what it is like to step into another's. While people are busy with their own technological worlds, building ever smarter cities, plotting just in time international flights and shipping routes, other animals are busy doing animal things, growing, uh, uh, um, burrowing, nesting, foraging, roaming, migrating. Sometimes human animal worlds fit together as when my dog, Fred Farley, understands my outstretched hand be pointing at something in the distance. And sometimes the human and animal worlds don't fit. And when they don't, the two usually go unnoticed by each other. We pay little attention to myriad birds and bugs and beasts. But as we humans span the globe in increasingly complex ways, we come up against other animals who perceive the earth differently. The time and space between humans and animals are out of joint. And the disjunction serves no dream. Dun, dun, dun. Uh, so in January 2006, one of the largest naval vessels in the history, the USS Nemesis class supercarrier USS Ronald Reagan, cuts a formidable path across the ocean. Gunmetal gray for the length of three football fields, rising some 20 stories above the water and weighing in at 100,000 tons, is a military fortress at sea bearing 70 planes and a well-trained crew of 5,000. The ship sets off from San Diego on its maiden deployment. The mission, support the U.S. troops in the Iraq war. The Reagan makes it to Brisbane, Australia, where it docks to resupply and allow the crew some time on land. While at port, the ship is held hostage to an unforeseen spineless foe. Floating idly along the coastline, translucent blue membranes absorb the warmth of the shallow waters of sunny days. And in heartbeat rhythms, they pulse, taking in water and pushing it out to propel just a bit further along the ocean current. These few blubber fish going along the waves happen upon a cross current, rushing them further inland and bringing with them other jellies. Soon, a bloom of jellyfish is moving and undulated waves towards Brisbane's military port. It is slow, yet persistent. Then one after the other, after the other, after tens of thousands, protean membranes push up against a metal floating fortress where they are decidedly and insistently stopped. 
while bobbing against the ship's steel plates, the gelatinous, uh, the jellies encounter another current when the draws in vast amount of water for the vessel's engines, where two Westinghouse nuclear reactors are ever thirsty for the sea to cool their core. These unwitting animals gain entry into the vital center of the warship. It's like a scene from the 1977 Star Wars film where rebels against the Empire discover an exhaust port that leads to the destruction of the Death Star. One, two, ten, hundreds and then thousands of jellyfish float inside vast tubes until with nowhere to go. They push and crowd and crush each other as tentacles and membranes and goo fill crates and pipes. Pounds of jellyfish flesh accumulate until it's enough to prevent water from entering the engine's condensers. The problems begin to show up on the ship's monitors as the engine's temperatures rise. Without the seawater, the nuclear reactors were dangerously overheating. This situation becomes worrisome than a concern. Then a threat. Officers call in the local fire department. They order systems shut down and switch to vital ship organs to back and backup generators. So the eight and a half billion dollar, 100,000 ton car gun of the US military with its frictionless command in the global seas is stymied by spineless, rudderless animals who go with the flow straight to the bowels of a military vessel. These markers of animals' resistance make us rethink our dominion over the globe. They have perceived, felt, and moved with the world in ways we did not foresee since their inbuilt is radically different from our own. And this difference is their own opportunity to jam our cultural apparatus and machining defenses. Jellyfish have been around longer than humans. They live on Earth, they've lived on Earth some 700 million years, making them contenders for the oldest modified organ animal. We help the jellyfish thrive as we troll the seas for fish. We're hauling out their predators and competitors for food. Acidification of oceans due to global warming helps too. And jellyfish, jellies have become a worrisome problem and a concern. And yes, now a threat that will not stop. The oceans impoverished their fish, they multiply, fill the void. The last two decades have seen a six-fold explosion. The Sea of Japan alone has some 20 billion floating membranes of resistance. Ships wade through a sea of jellyfish and coasts are littered with their carcasses. We did not plan for any of this. We were just trying to clear the sea to give, uh, we were not trying to clear the sea to give them more room to flourish. Humans are simply going about human lives and providing for themselves, and certainly not with consideration or deference to ancient gelatinous entities. Without thinking of the implicit implications of our actions and the worlds and ways of other beings, we have made space for the jellies. They move in soft undulations as if to the music of WC. But then, with more room to grow and more food available, they increase in number and become a thriving population. While from ours, they have transformed into threatening hordes, more line of Wagner's Valkyries and poetics of WC. It's interesting. Um, Annalise uh, Gershman in Stone recounts a number of other instructive jellyfish clones. In uh, December 10th, 1999, uh, when 40, there were 40 million Filipinos who lost electricity with over half a nation without power, speculation began that there was a coup or an attack by the Islamic Liberation Front, an unstable government, the Droge of Estrada. The actual cause was a bloom of jellyfish that floated from the coast into the cooling system of the power plant. As the store recorded, quote, here we are at the dawn of the new millennium in the age of cyberspace, and we're at the mercy of jellyfish. The promise of the ethereal cyberspace and the enlightened new millennium gives way to a different animal comfort and chimera. It's a coup of sorts, not an overthrow of one head of state or another, not a revolution of conscious political will. Rather, the jellies are markers of durational earthly animal 
resistance against our world. And they reconfigure winners, losers, political states, and alliances. And of course, the first record power outage due to Joe's was a coal fired power plant in Australia in 1937. Their successful nuclear power closures include 1983, 84, 93, 2011, a reactor at St. Lucia. Nuclear power plant in Florida, the Turkey Point power plant in Florida in 1984, Tornes power plant in Scotland, and the Shimu's nuclear power plant in Japan, both in 2011, the Diablo nuclear power plant in 2012, a Swedish power plant in 2005, and again in 2013, and the list, the hit list, is growing. With its other cutting corrosions on the battleship, we're feeling the nestled comfort of the home powered by local power plants. Humans are making a world less richer, less felt connected to the world. Culture is often a way of attempting of arriving, evading, getting human bodies on this earth, and so dismissing our contact with animals and their worlds. Animal frictions and animality, with their sure corporality, insistent presence, get suppressed by culture. Occasionally, a creature goes contrary to human design and expectations. The critter becomes a clever one-off event circulated by social media, laughed off, and then quickly forgotten. The collection of such events pops our social our social bubble and causes us to rethink our relationship to the earth. And bursting this in both is what philosophers Alexander Galloway and Eugene Thacker call the exploit in their book with the same title. And by the way, I'm really happy that Eugene decided to write afterwards for this book. I was really honored. Um, he was with me when I first started this project in uh, 2005. So he's, he's seen its evolution. Uh, the term comes from computer science, where hackers find a weakness in the operating system defenses and use the opening as a portal for entry. Shifting from computers to cultural systems, you can say that the animal revolution finds holes in human cultures which have tried to keep the friction and messiness of the earth at a distance. Jellies wander into machinery designed to use human passage across the ocean. Animals exploit openings where culture has failed to sheathe the physicality of our bodies and machines. Sitting suddenly among our advances is in the materiality of things, the physicality of the human body itself. The revolution hacks the physicality of our technologies and our bodies. An eagle takes down a drone, a shark bites through an underwater high speed fiber optic cable, ants infest electronics, short circuit computers. They do not see our technologies as modes of using human life. Rather, these objects are novel problems in the world. They respond from their social, from their way of sensing these objects. Um, I should point out that uh, a few of these illustrations are, you know, I kind of try to provide moments that work with some of these illustrations so they have no break the chains of the opening. And of course, the uh, no jellyfish. Um, I thought I'd move on to the nuclear war. Uh, it's it's uh, su such a great, and you don't know that it's here, but this is visible. So, um, and Marie did a really great job of providing something that is both kind of funny and really dark at the same time. And it works with this, where I'm kind of trying to leverage humor into thinking something else and taking us elsewhere. So, um, and I have a chapter on humor, the role of humor and animals uh, called Laugh Now, but when they will be in charge um, uh, along those lines. Return of the repressed. Radioactive wild war invading towns in Southern Germany. They take out a man in a wheelchair. They break through the fences and run on the road, shutting down highway traffic. They travel in packs, scavenging for food. Police scramble to restore order in urban centers. The radioactive war are armed with a post apocalyptic payload. We live in the wake of the 1986 Chernobyl nuclear disaster. By forging on radioactive plants, the animals embody the return of a disaster many seek to repress. 
press. Following the collapse and meltdown of Iraq, the Chernobyl, many of hundreds of thousands of people were evacuated from the 20 mile exclusion zone around the nuclear power plant. Residents exposed to radiation suffered from radiation poisoning, leukemia, thyroid cancer, and estimates are that some 4,000 people could die from illness related to the accident. As for the radioactive bore several hundred miles away, Germany, with an omnivorous appetite and sturdy snout for rooting out food, they consume their landscape. They eat acorns and nuts and insects. They also unearth truffles and tubers and mushrooms, which absorb high degrees of radioactive waste that decades ago drifted downward from the power plant, uh, power plant meltdown. In droves, the poor make their way to nearby towns intent upon a density of food in trash cans, park bins, and alleys. Weighing in at some 400 pounds each, and with tusk and unpredictable temperament, they are given right away in urban areas. A coarse hair and wildness stands at odds with the orderly small town environment in which they find themselves. Decades hence, Chernobyl fades from memory. Generations have passed for humans, but for the radioactive elements, the disaster, uh, but for the radioactive elements that the disaster unleashed, life has just begun. The nuclear reactor core fire lives on, but invisibly, and the bore carry it with them. They bear the materiality of our failed technology and the indifference to life of a radioactive isotope. Perhaps we should have paid more heed to our fictions. Godzilla, fabricated prehistoric marine reptile monster and powered by nuclear radiation, reminded Japan and the rest of the world that radioactive material is a beast more forceful and lives longer than humans can imagine. Godzilla makes the otherwise invisible nuclear threat visible. His overall indifference to humans makes him a fitting avatar for radioactive material. And here I go on to talk a little bit about Mothra, Vanga, and the whole sort of crew of uh, strange creatures. Um, then on other nuclear disaster movies followed, the Japanese franchise, uh, there's uh, the 1954 Hollywood film, Them, uh, an early atomic bomb test in, nuclear, in New Mexico mutates common ants into giant human killing beasts. The wise character, Dr. Harold Melford, played by Miracle on 34th Street, Edmund Quinn, observes, may be witness to a biblical prophecy come true. And there shall be destruction and darkness come upon creation, and the beast shall reign over the earth. Mystery and ominous rule the day. If these monsters get started as a result of the first nuclear bomb in 1945, gun smoke cowboy actor James Ernest asked Medford at the film's conclusion, what about all the others we have exploded since then? To which Medford replies, nobody knows. When man entered the atomic age, she opened the door into a new world. What we'll eventually find in that new world, nobody can predict. Human control comes with a dose of repression. We bury the unwanted. We look away from the hideous progeny of our disaster. If we keep busy enough and avoid looking at minor changes, everything seems fine. But the dose of repression builds, the minor starts to grow to something major. We convince ourselves that this must be a once in a hundred year sort of event until the once in a hundred year perfect storm seems to happen more and more often, until despite our best efforts, the cancerous growth cannot be ignored. People who want to move forward from the calamities of Chernobyl and uh, uh, Fukushima into a more hopeful, optimistic future. Our machines will carry us into brighter futures. We were promised flying cars, we cry. We who feel the techno-cultural imperative, we want to forget our vulnerabilities as bodies on Earth and get on with our cultural lives, the quips to tweet, the most to serve, and the veneer of stability and progress to maintain. We recall the exploit that humans and animals may live in different perceptual worlds, but corporeally share the same Earth, which the revolution leverages as an opening to rupture culture. 
The animals won't let us forget our disasters or the earth we share. There is nowhere to run in geological time of radiation in the evolutionary time of animals carrying the disaster ongoing effect back to us. They are the return of the repressed. These unpaid actors of ecological remembering are not tricked out in Japanese monster costumes. There is no man in latex, no puppetry, no scale models. The exclusion and sanctuary around Chernobyl is also known by an existential title, the zone of alienation. Who is alienated if not we humans? First from time outside of human time, the time, the half-life of radioactive elements, and then from the physical bodies that do not conform to the planned technological progress. Even these beasts seem more modest than our fictions imagine. Creatures like boars have become the real Godzillas, invading our cities, tusk and snout, to remind us of our breached boundaries of human control. And here I talk about a little bit about the um, Hanford Nuclear Site, which is uh, the largest uh, nuclear uh, waste repository in the U.S., uh, home of the Fat Man Thong, where uh, radioactive bunnies have been discovered. So. Okay, I'll just two, one more short reading and may, maybe something else. Um, After a lot of instances, and these are all nonfiction, uh, creative nonfiction, I might slightly change the detail here or there, um, but maybe kind of been going a little bit time. Um, the second half of the book is uh, more how humans might get engaged with the revolution. And uh, this is the initial term like, to that. It's called the State of the Union, which I thought might be interesting. Uh, the multi-species team. The first president of the United States was a cyborg. George Washington's various were a cabinet of curiosity, holding 18th century natural history lessons, economic exchanges, and political relations. Contrary to popular belief, none of his teeth were made of wood. Instead, his dentures were plumes and metals. He bought teeth from some of his slaves who certainly felt the asymmetrical power of the exchange. Other teeth were likely from corpses. Some were from cows and horses fashioned to fit a human mouth. Teeth were made from elephant tusks. Perhaps some were from whale bone. Also in his mouth were parts of the earth itself, mined and refined metals, including tin, copper, and brass alloy. Rolling his tongue against his teeth, Washington could feel prehistoric time. He would clench the tusk of an elk animal from a distant continent against the bone of a creature from the deep seas. While sipping a brandy, he would in cold, damp lines, catch a, catch a hint of the fire and smoke from smelting and the acrid taste of minerals. He might muse on the relationship between cow teeth and the beef he was eating, or his horse teeth and the bit and bridle he held like a connective string to the teeth of his war horse, Nelson. Did he ever look at one of his servants, look into his mouth in the vacuous space among his teeth, and while holding the slave's tooth in his own mouth, think of the relationship between the two of them beyond a commodity exchange? In the dark of evening, after a company has left, in the quiet of his home, Washington unburdens himself of the craft that he is still comfortably fitted in heavy form of bone and metal. His jaw clenches and he feels the absence of the shape in his mouth. Before cleaning it and putting the apparatus away, he looks at it, glimmering with saliva and candlelight. Now neither in his mouth nor in the humans and animals and earth whence the dentures came, he thinks of those absences, the incompleteness that he and these others have. He holds the, their missing jigsaw puzzle pieces in his hand. In the dark vacuity of night, the dark emptiness of his mouth, and out there the emptiness of the space that once held substance, he feels a connecting mortality. He's aware of this time on earth is bought at the expense of others, but still his art will lead to the grave. He and the nation he leads are propped up, while 
avoid as far as it. In the waywardness of the night, the teeth feel like a haunted talisman that holds the specters of other lives. How much of these other lives resonate in the talisman that President carries in, in his cavernous mouth? The animal revolution is hacked into the head of the head of the state by exploiting the decay of his teeth. The words he speaks come from a mouth filled with slaves, corpses, and animals. His words vibrate from elements of deep time and earth, and his food is masticated by them as well. This towering leader might make use of humans, animals, and minerals, but what a figure for a future power as the revolution plants itself intimately within the president. Washington has felt and daily knows that his voice is not his own. If the president is a mouthpiece for the nation, the country speaks as a heterogeneous, more than human, mineral, animal, human state of the union. It is a place of many beings with many lives, each in their worlds, grinding against each other and negotiating a shared earth. So um, I, I decided kind of impromptu to read one last little thing, kind of inspired by this uh, one figure here, the hairy kind of figures. Um, when I was writing the book, I'm, I'm deeply indebted to Matt Bell, uh, creative writer and author of uh, uh, Appleseed, and uh, now a, a craft book called Refuse to Be Done, uh, aptly named, because um, he helped me understand that this kind of writing, it wasn't just that you would write one layer, you keep writing, you, instead of like a, a three-story building, building it, make it 30 stories. Right, keep layering the work. Um, and he really pushed me to do that. And I'm an, you know, I come from an academic background, which is about telling. It's like start showing, develop out the scenes, and layer the scenes. And he's very helpful with that. And then when I was, thought I was done, and thanks to Doug Romato, the editor of the press, to really push me to write, finish writing this book. I thought it was done maybe around May of, uh, during the pandemic. And, uh, Showed it to Matt, I've been showing him pieces, and he was really coaching me along. He said, um, you can push further. He said, this, this is a good book, I can print it, but you can do more. He said, keep swimming and save nothing for the return. So part of me is out there still swimming. And um, one, one of the things he says, you know, what about yourself? Where are you in this book? And uh, so I wrote something called Bearing Witness. And I'm gonna, this, I haven't planned this, so I'm going to first read and we'll see if it might get a little chalk. Uh, Bearing Witness, hair, scat, sasquatch, resonant relations in the opening, intoxication of ghosts, dwelling differently, I believe. There's a quote, the division of life into vegetable and relations, organic and animal, animal and human, passes first of all as a mobile border within living humans, King George Oregon in his theory. In the film Memento, because of a recent brain trauma, the protagonist cannot retain events in his long-term memory. This makes it difficult for him to track down the unknown person who killed his wife. He wakes up forgetting if he has a wife and forgetting his intention to find the killer. His solution is to tattoo her death and the facts of the case on his body. His skin becomes the outward sign, the things his inner mind cannot contain. The clues are inked into him. While the movie had a lot of logical problems, I always liked an almost religious figuration of the tattoo as an outward sign of an inward symbol. But I never got a tattoo. I'm covered in hair, forearms, biceps, triceps, shoulders, back, legs, most definitely chest. Language and tattoos as tools for memory and meaning never cohered with the animality of my body. Hair as the friction to reading and writing prevents my self description. Once on a beach, I took my t shirt off. And one of my very careless female friends gasped. She was not amused. 
I went to the Natural History uh, Museum in New York with the infamous Guy Thomas, looking at the mock-up of a life-size model of man with all, I whispered, he's got nothing on me. My word sign is the hair of animality. I awaken every morning in dress, aware of my body and world, one that has to be covered and fitted, hair tucked into my shirt with extra high shirt button to keep it down. Then I can be like other people at work. The ones whose bodies do not get offend, do not give offense by their animality. More recently, I've adopted the Sasquatch as a comrade. I don't know any Sasquatch yet, but I talk to them when alone. You understand, you outcast and haunted, hunted, malformed being somewhere between beasts and humans. I'm convinced that the sustained search for Bigfoot is so that one day, when captured, the hominoid can profess to people can profess to people what it's like to be the missing link. They have a non-human animal comportment, intelligence that can communicate this animal nature to us. Or maybe Sasquatch is the external sign for us all, a collective cultural sign of our animality and our desire to commune with it. The proof of our animal nature is there, elusive and blurry and on the horizon. Sometimes the inner incidents of revolution do not ask us. They come uncalled for and unabated to break through the, uh, our complacency. But even without such insistent moments, the animals are out there in their long trajectory of evolution. We can provide an opening for these events, these encounters with animality, these moments of resonant relation, where we are pulled from ourselves into a third space, a disjunctive, disjunctive, a disjunctive conjunction. We're disjointed from our world. We find there is a larger open field to play amid us and them. In this pasture or parking lot or backyard or remote woodlands, we find that our own corporeal being, with its frictions and physicalities, is in conversation with fur or scales or feather or claw or hoof or beak or tusk or dark eyes. A metonymic part of the animal becomes a lure, and then we find ourselves in a still pause and drawn into another animal's relation to the earth. Standing there in our animality, with the grit, with the grit of the world at our feet, we share that dirt of the earth, feel a thickness of the air between humans and animals. The animal world will return, and the animal's worlds will recede. But such events are an opening of awareness that lingers. Once in a moment of mourning, I shaved my hair, all of it, as if something deep was lost in me, a new growth would come from shedding it. I saved some of the hair and put it in a handcrafted wooden bowl with its grain worn smooth from years of use. Then I headed to the mountains. At the height of 14,000 feet, well above the tree line along the continental divide, geologic time is palpable in every root to rock step and every expansive view. Along the shoulder of the mountain, walking the path of my descent, is a herd of mountain goats. It was a rare sight in these, in these mountains. Their dark, unreadable eyes watched me. They walked on, and I cautiously walked behind them, giving them ample distance. And along the way, I collected their shedded strands of tough balls of hair. Once home, I put these weathered tufts into the smooth wooden bowl. There, my black hair rested against the white goat hair. Threads mingled. It was not a popular item for visitors of my house, but it made sense to me and gave me peace. There were artifacts from the moment. These were artifacts from moments. The, they were markers and reminders of affinities between bestial beings. Why couldn't they see that? Here are fragments from distant mountain beasts meet the distant fragments of myself. The threads talk by touching. Willy clear air space and something to my earthbound living life, my social being, my awkward weighted inopportune view with other animals. Sometime later, a dear friend gave me a thrift store coffee mug with 
poorly rendered goat of moss on it. The goat was not quite right. It was not a satyr, but as if the artist who only knew how to draw humans was tasked with rendering a goat, and as if they had never seen a goat before, but had to form it from secondhand descriptions. Despite the legend of Ethiopian goats discovering coffee berries that would somehow redeem this bow shaped goat log and make it an icon of caffeine consciousness, I only drank whiskey from it. And with whiskey comes the intoxication of bodies traversing mountain peaks with no regard for the world below. While mistake for a romantic construction, it's my way of knowing without language. I wanted a rational dis I don't want a rational discourse that drags animals into the human world as trophies for human dominion or icons of cuteness. I long for an expression and marker of remembering worthy of the encounter. Encounters change the state of affairs. I've seen things, and that changes everything. Such moments do not have to be fleeting but can be a part of our stories we tell ourselves about ourselves. It can be part of who we are. This changes the narrative for culture. I believe, says those who look to the stars for alien life or deep into the woods and the sign of Bigfoot, we have an array of cultural myths about animals. Believe these myths and take them seriously. Activate them. They are not allegories or fantasy. They are here and now. They are values and ethics and actions. Science has its role. We fashion wonder from images of giant squid brought to us from research vessels that plumb the depths of the ocean where light never penetrates. We marvel at extra files that live in boiling water at frigid temperatures near a mile below the Antarctic. Magic has its place as well. Riding a horse in the enchanted is an enchanted act, such that one can begin to believe in senators. Standing at a precipice on a high desert plateau and watching a California condor die from heights, extending near nine foot wingspan, a swoop inches from one's head, one can feel for a moment the wonder of flight, not abstractly, not at a distance but as if transmitted from bird to human. The animal revolution hacks into what it means to be human and opens us to recognize animality within us and out there. They beckon, believe, and heeding their call can change who we are, can change the human world, and transform the earth on which all beings dwell. Thanks to you all. Yeah. So I don't know, um, we can just chat if you like for a bit. We have a little bit of time. Yeah. Any questions? This was really hard. I like the transformation from academic prose to something like this uh, took years. First, wrote about this stuff, and some of you have known me. Thank you for coming out. Up. I wrote about it in terms of philosophy. So there's a lot of phenomenology, there's a lot of continental philosophy stuff. And it just was not working. I mean, it may be coherent as intellectual ideas, but it didn't have the feel and the wonder and the grit and the fascination I wanted. And so it was only after reading a lot of creative nonfiction that I was able to sort of say, okay, that's, that's the thing. And then to try to train myself to write. So, it's sort of a crossover book. You can see the references to philosophical ideas, but hopefully you don't have to know that to kind of get what this is going. That's the story of what's going on. Thank you so much, Rob, for that. I have a question. Yeah. Yeah. 
Thanks. Yeah, and so I think I had sent you kind of what I had at that point. And you're like, okay, I'm game to do this. And you know, it was the point in my career where I was like, okay, I'm kind of done. I've done some of the academic stuff. Um, let's do something else. And I have such regard for how art can open worlds and wonder that um, I wanted to engage an artist, but like, who do you get to sign on to something like this? And Marina was really like, oh yeah, we're gonna do this. And you know, COVID happens and like, no, so something needs to happen here. I need to physically be in this space. And you know, God bless her, Kate <laughs> flew across country. And uh, we hung out for, for weeks on end. And uh, I mean, neither of us have been around people. I've seen people in ages. And so all of a sudden, I have some, someone in my space, and it's all that kind of intensity. And we just take these weird and rambling hikes out in the desert. Um, they're kind of urban hikes. I mean, literally, you're looking at like house, gorgeous houses. And then all of a sudden, there's nothing. And you're in the middle of nowhere. And, uh, and so I think there's the, the inhumanness of the desert and the idea that the desert is this inhuman space. And it's really powerful. It's incredibly powerful. It's like it's not going to change. There's nothing green. And the plants don't like you. Okay. So the, I mean, the rocks don't like you. The plants don't like you. It's really that kind of viscerality. Um, so that. That's a good space for thinking. It's, I think also a good space for making. Uh, thanks to ASU, we were able to get Marina some studio space and uh, diligently every day would go and say, okay, I'm working on this beat. You know, uh, once she cracked a code, uh, um, it's very good at like, I need to develop a code for the thing. And once the code was there, it became this kind of surreal exploration. I mean. I was initially interested in, I think both of us, about with the Hardy Boys, you know, when you're reading the story and it has the little illustration, you see the illustration, you're like, what's going to happen next? And so you, you look at this and you're like, what's going to happen next? And we also bonded over uh, Thomas Buick in 18th century natural history. So somewhere between Buick meets Hardy Boys meets Dadaism, you know, and so it's this kind of strange and curious thing that you open it and you can see that there is a connection to some of the stories, but it also has this other dimensionality to it. And that's what I like about the images stand alone and these curious enigmatic possibilities. Um, and that takes us elsewhere. And I think the next is like, I, I just kind of want you to draw stuff and I'll write from it, you know, and that's like reverse it or something. So. Um, and, and, and like, yeah, so I didn't read from some of these and you can imagine like, what are these satyrs doing or, you know, where, where are these bonobos who are fucking doing or, you know, the, 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 the boy and the, and the teacup. Um, so that it just kind of gets you curious about the kinds of worlds that are out there in our worlds. So at least for me, that was, that was kind of the idea. And using the, the charcoal on paper allowed it to have that feel like the Buick pieces or like the Thomas or uh, the, the, uh, the, the Hardy Boys pieces. Can I ask a thing? Please. Do I have to sign up for it? So, uh, what I think I, I'm always saying to this is that I'm not necessarily, I'm a paper runner, right? I'm not to steal. And it's interesting because I think this all of you guys may have seen. This book is a river line sheet, you know, it's this incredibly wrought, coherent, like going into the world to like take my business. And so it's like, it was like, it was not like, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I should never have said I can't write. I can't, I can't yeah. remember what I'm saying. Yeah. I'm just like, that's what you need to do. But it was a really good stuff in my mind because it was powerful yeah. because it was material, it felt like so. Yeah, no, that's good. Yeah, it's like finding these p 
pieces out there in the world and somehow making them cohere as if there's a narrative. Um, yeah, for both of us, that's the thing, right? So that, that's the whole thing of like the animal revolution, like all these incidents happen. It's just the way you put, put, I put it together as a narrative by uh, makes it very sleep. Okay, so I read a little bit from the manifesto, but then it goes right into um, these cows that break out from the slaughterhouse and their individual fates, which are each really weird, including finding themselves at a church, asking for sanctuary, and then um, the Pope and some peace doves that get attacked, and then you know, so it just adds on, and it, each one becomes a layer that adds to the next. Um, and, and again, just how how the stories are told. And I think you got that as well. It's like this, some of these strange layers. There is an earthiness, right, to the charcoal kind of. Yeah, I think that was really important, right? It was like your own exploration. It was like, I've never had my work in such a great, it's like, who has the opportunity to have their writing interpreted visually? And every reading is a misreading, of course, the majority of thing of like, and so it's like, it takes it elsewhere. And it's just such a generous thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, ideally, this is generative for both of us. And so, and hopefully for you, and you go out and generate your things. Um, I'm curious how we're able to make the background more traditional um, moving into more poetic form and collaborating within um, may have changed your research. Do you have your opinions to it? And what should stay or not be published? Yeah, thank you. That's such a generous and generous question. So, um, uh, how I, this, you know, the, um, after writing my road to surface encounters, which was about contemporary origin animals. Um, I wrote for the Minnesota Press blog a little thing about vulnerability. Um, and the, I think the Brookler, the sense of asking impossible questions. There was, what is an animal phenomenology? How can one ever understand the animal world? And here it's like, what is an animal revolution? So I'm asking impossible questions, questions that I know can't be answered. So I'm already exposing this vulnerability in a project that will not cohere. Right. And so um, the willingness, it started with a willingness to be vulnerable. I think uh, all of us are super aware of that these days. Um, and the result is I'm not going back to actually crying. Um, I have one or two small projects I have to you know, workshop. But, um, you know, uh, Dylan showed the visograph. Press stuff that we're doing now that it doesn't come out in so much for um, creating some calendars and a whole, so a whole bunch of creative and productive endeavors. And in other words, I think of, you know, and, and, and kudos to tenure and to being a full professor. I will say it's like, you know, the role of, like, we talk about the job stability of a professor is academic freedom. Part of it is to say and do things that give license that wouldn't be possible otherwise, right? Is to think otherwise, because thought of thought just is a circle that reproduces itself. 
and you see this in the academy now. So how to get outside that, you know, the unthought of thought, how can we break outside that circle? And these kinds of dialogues and these kinds of moments allow us to think otherwise. And so how can philosophers think something and think otherwise? Um, and frankly, hopefully more people will read this than anything else I've written, you know, because it is accessible and it should be. Um, so it's a, it's a real opportunity to, to, and I'm thankful for the creative writers and 